Welcome to the Prep Athletics Podcast. This is Corey Heights. Some battles. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if they got us. If they did, maybe, maybe. So you will get better as a player during that year. So it was kind of exciting. Like, oh, yes, yeah, somebody wants me. Welcome to the Prep Athletics Podcast. I am Corey Heights, the founder of Prep Athletics and the host of this podcast, which is featured on YouTube and all other platforms out there. Uh, today, I am excited to welcome my guest, uh, Coach Mike Mannix. Mike's a friend of mine who uh, we've known each other for years, and Mike's actually the head basketball coach for the boys team at Wilbraham and Monson Academy. Uh, after graduating from the University of Massachusetts Amherst, Mike was a video scout for the Indiana Pacers. And from there, he went on to be an assistant coach at Western New Mexico University before becoming the director of basketball operations at Drexel. And Mike has now been at Wilbraham and Monson since 2009. Mike, welcome to the show. Hey, Corey. Thanks. I listen a lot, so it's good to be on. Oh, I appreciate that. Well, you know how this starts. We got to know where you came from and why uh, basketball is your sport of choice. Yeah, um, I'm originally a Western Massachusetts guy, and that's, you know, that's where our school is set um, in the same region. Um, grew up in a city about <clears throat> 20 minutes away from Wilbraham. Um, and I was a public school kid, so boarding school, prep school was completely, almost completely new to me when I started working here. Um, but yeah, I spent majority of my life in Western Mass, and then even, like you said, I went to UMass, uh, which is right in Amherst. Um, and that's only, you know, 45 minutes away from Wilbraham here. It was only 20 minutes, 25 minutes away from my hometown. Um, so really it was in Western Mass up until I was about 22 or 23. Coached some high school ball early um, when I was actually still in college. And that's when I got started. Um, I was actually coaching high school ball at the same time I was a volunteer youth basketball coach um, in a Saturday morning league at our local YMCA. Um, and it was, I, I guess, getting into coaching basketball um, was probably all that was cultivated by, I'll say, two individuals. Um, a, a guy from my hometown, Hoyoke, Mass., that I knew growing up for a long time. Uh, he was a little bit older than me, a guy by the name of Jim Hart. Um, he was a high school coach at my high school. Um, he was a former athlete himself. I had a summer job where I worked uh, with him and for him. And um, he invited me to be on his coaching staff for his, he became a varsity coach um, after I graduated high school. And he invited me when I was in college to coach with his summer league high school team um, and just be on the summer league staff. So I started doing that when I was first in college. And then when I, um, was a freshman and sophomore in college, um, I started working in the basketball office at UMass when I was in school. And so that was really cool for me because I was a UMass fan growing up. And then I was in high school and Marcus Camby, um, you know, was bringing UMass to the final four with coach Cal. And so then to go there and then work in the basketball office. And um, what I did was I helped with a uh, film exchange which was kind of a neat thing to learn. I mean, I had no idea how any of that worked, you know, as a guy just coming out of high school, going into college, I'm like 19, 20 years old and learned about film exchange and how they scout. Um, and then I got really close with a couple of the assistant coaches and they let me start to work on the recruit mail outs that they used to do the old school stuff back in the late nineties and early two thousands. And every day we would stuff envelopes and we had hundreds of sheets of labels printed out you know, for each day of the week. And so every day you were sending, you know, um, the 50 or a hundred or sometimes 200 guys that they had, you know, on their lists, um, you know, some sort of news about UMass basketball. So um, that's how I got started coaching. And that's how I got really interested in high level basketball. And you went from that after you graduated to work as a scout, a video scout for the Pacers. So How'd you get that job and what did that entail? Yeah, so so that was a, a one-year internship mm -hmm. um, working with both the, the scouts. There's never a great title to put on that that job. It's always, uh, it was always a challenge to figure out exactly how to list that. Um, but it was a one-year internship coming out of, I was about a, a year graduated from college at that point. 
Um, and I worked with the video scouts. Um, that's not even their official name. They, they were kind of like the video guys, um, breaking down opponent film. Um, I worked with the college scouts, um, a guy by the name of Ryan Carr, that's now the director of scouting for the Pacers. He was like, um, he was an entry level college scout when I was with the Pacers in 2003. Um, he was a really, you know, he was, he was a young guy in the business then. And I worked with um, uh, a little bit with the guys that uh, did the European international scouting. Um, and for a Massachusetts kid to roll into the Pacers and have Larry Bird as the president of basketball operations and to actually have him, you know, call you on your office phone that, you know, we, I shared it with an assistant coach and another intern and another video guy. And he'd say, Hey, you know, um, bring up the game last night uh, from uh, North Carolina. Cause I want to take a look at Rashad McCants, um, you know, or Sean May or somebody like that. So um, that was pretty cool. Cause I mean, you, you know, I'm, 23 or 24 years old and you're knocking on Larry Bird's door bringing in a VHS tape you know and you're trying not to stumble <laughs> over your words and stuff like that you know because I just remember him making shots over Dominique and stuff um but uh, but that was that I mean that was uh one of the greatest blessings that's come into my life professionally uh to get that opportunity because that it opened a lot of doors for me as you can imagine um a lot of connections were made. Some some people high up in the basketball world at a much earlier time in my life and career than a lot of people get. And quite honestly, I got the job because it was listed on the NCAA jobs website. Wow. Okay. I just sent in my stuff um, and emailed the gentleman uh, that, that was the contact. He was the head video guy and a scout for the Pacers. And a couple of weeks later or so, found myself out there interviewing. And a month later, find myself going out to Indiana and living out there for about, I guess, 11 months. And um, just an awesome experience. What did you take away from that, Mike, that you can use now with your team? Um, as you can imagine, a million things, mm. right? Uh, but But that's a great question because – the one thing that I come back to and that sometimes I reference whether and it's recruiting or sometimes when I may be interviewing assistant coaches for our coaching staff, um, Rick Carlisle was his first year um, head coach with the Pacers that very year that I started. And he had just come from the Detroit Pistons. Um, and Rick was a big believer in offensively you do – um, you know, you, you scheme and you plan offensively based on the, the weapons and the strengths that you have, the players that you have and what they do well. And then that's what you should do offensively. And that was brand new for me, Corey, because I was all in on college basketball before I got to the NBA. I, you know, I worked in, you know, worked for the team at UMass. I had become really close with those coaches and they really said, you know, if you want to work in college basketball full time, you also have to become well-versed in the business of college basketball, you know, and, and, and you got to make connections and you got to, you know, just be a student of the game, but no student of the X's and O's in the game, but also know the business. So I was getting, you know, I was going to clinics. I was getting books. I was watching games, you know, and I was, I remember at one point trying to become really well-versed on like the Carolina secondary break. And so what I, so that's a long explanation of what I knew was systems. I knew offensive systems. Carolina ran secondary break. Um, you know, uh, there was the power offense that was from the 90s. There was, you know, a lot of different, you know, all those different offenses, UCLA high post and stuff like that. And so I knew offensive systems and I knew that coaches recruited for those systems. Like Dean Smith was still at Carolina and, and Bill Guthridge. And so those guys, they recruited to the Carolina secondary break and who fit. And it was a big time eye opener when I get to Indiana and Rick Carlisle is saying, we're going to run stuff that work well for Jermaine O'Neal, Ron Artest, Al Harrington and Reggie Miller to shoot it. Mm -hmm. And I remember filming a practice that was, I did that on occasion, but I would listen 
And my roommate and I had a notebook that we shared and we would take notes when the other guy was filming. And I'll never forget the first practice where that stuck out to me. And I use that to this day. And we're talking 18 years later. And I'm still telling families that come in here when they ask us about what kind of offense we run. And I say, in kind of a kidding way, show me who I have on my team and then I'll show you the offense that I run. Interesting. Yeah. Gotcha. And then you went from that to Western New Mexico and Silver City. My brother-in-law actually used to live there and oh, wow. um, haven't been there yet, but tell me how that turn of events happened. Cause that seems pretty random. Oh yeah. That's as random as it gets. Um, uh, my, my roommate, um, that I worked with in Indiana that was doing the same internship I was. Um, we were both, you know, when the internship ended, we were applying for every job on God's green earth for basketball because, you know, basketball coaching jobs is so hard to get. Right. So, we're, you know, both applying for jobs, calling our contacts, and seeing what's what. And I was, I was actually trying to stay in the NBA. Um, I, I had a conversation with the Celtics um, about doing some sort of small time video job with them, um, working with the scouts and everything in the advanced scouts um, that fell through. I was trying to stay with the Pacers if I could. Um, they were looking to create a position, didn't happen. And then my roommate, you know, we're, we're both went our separate ways when we moved away from Indiana when the job internship ended. And he called me up and he said, you know, I'm about to take this job with Florida State women's basketball. But I also had a job offer from a Division II school that I applied to because his family was out in Colorado. So he was kind of looking in that area of the country. And he said, I think you might like this. He said, because it, you know, it involves some of the stuff, you know, that we talked about getting involved with. And talked to the head coach. He was actually an East Coast guy. So we connected pretty well um, because he was a New York guy. And you know, a couple of weeks later, find myself flying out there and living in the dorm and, and uh, coaching, being the full time assistant coach and running the intramural program. So that's how that all came to be. Oh, great. Yeah. Great. And, and then from there, City, cool place. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. And then from there, you went to be the Dobo at Drexel under Bruiser Flint and right. um, did that for two years. What did you take away from that time that you use now with your the program? Drexel time? Mm -hmm. Organization. Okay. Organization. You got to be organized. Uh, I, you know, Bruiser Flint is, you know, one of my, one of my mentors in the game, like, you know, one of my top guys. Um, and, it, you know, I knew him from my UMass days cause he was the head coach when I got to UMass. So, um, you know, looking up to him as a younger coach and just as a, you know, as a kid still in college, watching him work and how he coached and everything, and then actually going to work for him full time. He was big on organization. Let's always have a plan, whether we're going to, you know, some of the obvious stuff, like you need to have a practice plan, of course. Um, you need to have a workout plan when you're working guys out in the spring. But, you know, he was big on, you know, let's meet, um, you know, once or twice a week, make sure we know what's going on in the office, make sure we have a plan about X, Y, and Z. And sometimes I thought, I, you know, he says this and, you know, we know we joke around about it now. I thought he was a little crazy with how organized we were and how he really concentrated on the details of things. And the details had to go right for the big plan to go right. And um, I get here and I was an assistant coach when I first came to Wilbraham, um, but started to see, you know, details were important when, you know, I was kind of like second in charge of the basketball program, being the assistant coach. And then eight years ago or so taken over as the head coach, um, it became evident right away that things will fall apart quickly. If you are not organized and you do not concentrate on the details. And after I became head coach, I can remember having a couple almost like apologetic conversations with brew where I would talk to him on the phone and say, man, sometimes I thought you were really crazy and I got to apologize because I get it. There is, you are responsible as the head coach for how this thing runs, you know? Um, and relative to the level that I'm at in prep school, it's not division one college basketball, but it is high level prep school basketball. And if things look a mess or if things get messed up, people are only going to look at me. So you better make sure that you concentrate on the details to make sure that it work, you know the big plan works out. 
Yeah. Now, that's what I take away. Just details. Be organized. Absolutely. Now, give me a little bit of information. Uh, well, not just me, but the listeners about Wilbraham and Monson. Like, what's the pitch you make to kids? Like, why come there? What's the academics like, the culture like? If I'm looking at other New England prep schools, give me, give me your pitch. So um, we've been around for 200 years, you know, so when we start recruiting, I make sure that people know that we're a well-established school. You and I have the conversation <laughs> sometimes. I love the phrase brick and mortar. We are very brick and mortar. Mm -hmm. um, 200 years, a lot of bricks here, a lot of bricks. Um, but we're a well-established school. 200 years, um, we have a, a, a very good reputation uh, basketball-wise, and it's been solid for a long time. Um, we've had high level players coming in here, um, for, um, you know, 12 plus years, um, even a little bit before I got here. So probably, you know, 14 to 15 years, there's been good players coming into the program. Um, and it's, that's been consistent. So we do have a good reputation in New England prep school basketball. So people know pretty much right away, you know, it's a solid program. Right. It got, you have some feet to stand on there. Um, I say us as a school and we're a beautiful campus. First of all, and people get here and they're like, wow, this is nice. It's, it's a nice place. Um, our setting, to be honest with you, Corey, is very appealing to families. Um, the students certainly notice our recruits certainly notice, but mom and dad's really notice too, that our actual setting here is, is pretty neat. Um, and pretty unique. We're a, you know, a couple hundred acre campus, lots of trees, nice green fields, nice old classic looking brick buildings. But um, different than some of our competitors, we have a city of 100,000 plus people that is 10 minutes away. So you don't have to get on a school bus or take an Uber 45 minutes away to go to a grocery store which is, is really nice. You know, the family see that, um, you know, you can go to a nice restaurant that's 10 or 15 minutes away. Um, we are located right next to the center of Wilbraham, which is a small thing, but it's convenient. Um, so we get that big city next to us that has everything you could need for, you know, to have an entertaining weekend. You know, if you, if the kids want to go to the movies, a um, couple airports, that are nearby, one that's 45 minutes away, that's a good big airport, um, a major airport that's 90 minutes away. And then we have, you know, the, the small town, you know, old New England feel to it. Um, that's That's got a really kind of charming feel to it. So our campus is incredibly appealing to families. Um, and then um, I think what we've created here is we've created good continuity within the basketball program. Um, I've been here, this will be year number 13 for me. Um, and if you really dive into the details of Wilbraham and Munson and the people that are here, you'll know that it's, it's a place that kids really can call home because adults, the faculty have been willing to call this home for a very long time. Um, our head of school has been here for over 20 years. Um, our athletic director has been here for over 30 years. We have a history teacher, retired soccer coach that's been here for almost 40 years. We have a Latin teacher that's coached every sport under the sun that's been here for 45 years. People don't do that unless it's a good place. And so that's what I say. You know, I, I don't I don't think there's any one thing that I that I am ever to able to ever able to really tell a family and it just is like boom you know Wilbraham is the best it's that we check a lot of boxes mm -hmm. you know and we we have a lot of strengths and we are a school that has a good academic reputation we are set in a beautiful area and it is a it is a people it is it is full of people that have cared about the success of kids for a long time and that's coaches and teachers dorm parents and that's the people that might serve your kids lunch every day. Like they have relationships with the kids. And I think that's what our school is all about. Um, the people that are here that create relationships with the kids. Yeah, that's great. That's a great pitch. We're going to take a, a time out here to do a, a new segment called famous, famous alumni from your school. 
And these are a couple I pulled off Wikipedia. And then if there's any uh, you want to add to this, let me know. All right. This is, uh, this. <laughs> tell me if you know who Russell Conwell is. Oh, man. They're, you're not getting graded on this. So okay. 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 All right. He's the founder of Temple University. <laughs> I'm, I was about to say, get out of here. I'll say, get out of here. I wow. I didn't know that one. I, okay. I've studied our Wikipedia page. I didn't know that one. <laughs> All right. Joey Santiago. He's one, all right, one of the members of the band, the Pixies. Oh, that does ring a bell now. Okay. Okay. All right. And last uh, of, from my list is Bill Guerin. Oh, Billy Guerin. Absolutely. Billy Guerin uh, won a Stanley cup with the Jer New Jersey devils. Uh, so played, played hockey here. And um, now he is president or general manager of the, the um, Minnesota North stars. Wild. Wild. Oh, Minnesota Wild. He used to be the North Star. Minnesota Wild. I hope he doesn't watch this because he's also on a board of trustees and I just messed up the name of his team. <laughs> but yeah, we actually are starting hockey here this year. He's been a very instrumental part of that. Okay. And he's just, you know, according to Wikipedia, he's won the Stanley Cup title four times. Four times. So, but that's the three I pulled. Any uh, other famous alum that people should know about? Um. Oh boy. That's a good one. Um. Oh. There was like some poets and mathematicians and people from the yeah. There, um, there was a former poet laureate um, that just passed away a few years ago. He came here and he read to us uh, some of his work once. I, I can't remember the, his name off the top of my head, but he was a classic one. He was good. He was live and in person. I'm not a big poetry guy, but he was good. Yeah. Okay. Well, that was our uh, this week's episode of Famous Alumni from the prep school we're talking to. I like it. All right. Hey, uh, tell me about the NEPSEC AA. I know you won the title recently, um, which is a tough thing to do. Tell me what makes NEPSEC AA so special. Man, uh, top to bottom, it is strong. There's no nights off. Um, and um, I would say we have a very, and you've seen this based on your other previous episodes of the podcast, we have a very strong coaching group um in terms of i mean their guys have great resumes and they're great coaches but we're a pretty tight-knit group for a fairly large group of a conference you know i mean there's we just had some new schools join us so i think our new count is maybe 16 who just joined um st george's oh, in sure. Port rhode island and the darrow school that's just outside of albany new york um so they, they joined us and we might have another coming back in maybe. Um, but coaches are a tight knit group. I mean, we, uh, we zoomed a bunch of times during the pandemic. We didn't have a ton to talk about. Um, and it, it just kind of becomes like a coaches, uh, like a, a round table, uh, a lot of jokes, um, at each other's expense sometimes, but, um, I'll be honest. I, I tell some of my friends and coaching that are outside of NEPSAC, I've, um, I can remember watching the 30 for 30 on uh, Requiem uh, of the Big East that uh, ESPN put out years ago. And it's a classic one. If you haven't seen that one, it's great. And they, they really talk about the personalities of the coaches that helped to really get the Big East kickstarted because you had Roly Massimino, John Thompson, Luke Carnesecca, UConn coming up with Jim Calhoun, Coach Bayham at Syracuse and you know, Rick Patino was at Providence. I mean, PJ Carlissimo at Seton Hall, like a who's who, you know, I mean, there's a lot of hall of famers in that group that I just mentioned. They might be all hall of famers. Um, and on a lower level, right. Like, uh, you know, not as much stardom, but we have meetings that I swear to you, I wasn't at those big East meetings in 1985, 1986, but I, I got a bet that they are very similar. <laughs> Um, a lot of jokes. Sometimes uh, there has to be a, a little bit of refereeing, you know, it's all, but we all come back together and it's all good because what I love about our group of coaches is it's all about trying to make our league stronger slash we're never going to shortchange the kids. Um, and those two things really go hand in hand because we know as the strength and the perception of our league grows, so does the opportunity for the kids. Mm -hmm. And that is great. And I, I'll say this as true as I've said anything. 
every single coach in our league, I can tell you, I know wants the best for their kids first before anything else. And, um, and we, we have a special group of coaches and I, I enjoy our league calls. I enjoy our league meetings um, most of the time. And, uh, and they're, and they're good guys, but from a basketball standpoint, uh, like getting on the floor, um, you can watch some double A games and you can compare them to like high level college basketball games. You know, you could go to a NESCAC division three, high level NESCAC basketball game, you know, maybe between Amherst college and Williams or something of the like with guys that will play professional basketball, or you could go to a, you know, low major division one game, maybe in the NEC or something like that. You're going to watch some NEPSAC basketball, some double A basketball that the competitive, the competitiveness in the game and the amount of talent makes you feel like you're watching a college basketball game. You don't get that from a lot of high school games. No. And I also think the thing that we do, um, playing 18 minute halves is something kind of unique. Um, I, I wish we could play 20, you know, but 18 you know, we're close. And that, that also gives you a college feel because I go to, you know, I, I go to recruit high school players at, you know, public high schools, Massachusetts, Connecticut, wherever it might be. And I watch eight minute quarters sometimes without a shot clock. And I'm like, man, oh, man, I, I could not imagine right now, knock on wood, I could not imagine trying to coach in that game format. And, and so I come back here and, you know, I get to work with our players and I get to coach in these games against these other great coaches, players, and with 18-minute halves and a 30-second shot clock and three referees out on the court. And I think to myself, I'm a lucky basketball coach mm -hmm. because double a provides you a ton of talent, a college game format and coaches that these guys have full-time jobs, just like I do at their schools and their coaching jobs. I know just like mine feel like full-time jobs. I feel like, you know, I, in a, in a good way, I feel like I have two full-time jobs. Yeah. Well, you do. I mean, no. It's true. Let me ask you this. Um, you have a big time player right now in Kyle Filipowski. And I know last weekend uh, was a big event, um, the NEPSAC showcase, and there were tons of, of high major coaches there to watch him. Tell me what it's like when you have a player like Kyle or a player like Winning Gabriel, who ended up playing for Kentucky and, and with the Pelicans now. Like, what's it like uh, with their recruiting? How do you advise a family when it comes to that not just the high-end players but all your all your kids what's your what's your recruiting motto um one is you know this is a very general thing like you're saying like all the players whether you're top of division one or whether you're you know um, um you know competitive division three type player make sure in the um in the very beginning stages pay attention to who's paying attention to you that's very important. And that can be applied at all levels um, because you may want the top of division one, but if you have several low major coaches coming to our low major division one coaches coming to our open gyms in September and wanting to talk to you, that's the group that you need to focus on. And I always tell our players when I recruit them here before they come in my office or even when they're here, I tell them and their families, don't get rid of your goals. I'm not saying throw those out the window. So if your goal is to play at a place like a North Carolina or, you know, something like ACC, Big Ten, someplace like that, not saying throw those out the window. Keep those alive. Work for those. Absolutely. Work like you want those because I know that will push you. But when it comes time for you to really communicate with schools about your recruiting and paying attention to what's going on in your recruiting life. Make sure you pay attention to who's paying attention to you because that's who's in your life right now. And that's that there's a very good chance. That's who you end up with. Yeah. And are you with your players in the past? Has it been like the AU you guys are making the decisions, the, the families are making a decision their own. You're helping them mainly, or is it a combo or is it just depend on the family? 
Um, yeah, I think it depends on the family and, and the, and the player, um, and what the, you know, what their family might look like family dynamic. Um, uh, but I can tell you in both Wenyon's case and in Kyle's case, um, uh, good family around them, um, giving good, solid support, you know, that, uh, that I, I can sit back as a parent and a coach and, you know, I can say like right now I'm going through it with Kyle and the way that his mom and dad support him. I can sit back and say to myself, that is exactly what a coach would want to see, you know, uh, take your time, think things through, be appreciative, all that stuff. So, yeah, it's good. Um, let me ask you this. You worked with Wenyon and he's now in the NBA. Is he the only NBA player you've coached at Wilbraham? Um, yeah, he's the only NBA player that I've coached. Um, we did have um, a guy that uh, um, did get some time in the G League and overseas um, a few years back. And good luck, Okanobo. But Wenyon is the first uh, real full-time um, NBA player that we've had. So you probably have the same I have where kids reach out to you saying, hey, I want to come to prep school and play, then get a scholarship for D1, then go to the NBA. Right. Yeah. And I've been asking this of all the coaches that uh, have coached NBA players. Um, tell me about Winion. What made him an NBA player? What characteristics did he possess? Um, you know, it goes probably goes without saying because every, everybody probably has the, you know, a high level special work ethic. Right. That's um, what it is across the board, Mike. Yeah. 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 It's the work ethic. Um, he dedicated himself to the weight room. Um, by the time he got into his senior year here, uh, which was good because he, he didn't have a lot of experience in the weight room before getting here, um, started to get kind of, you know, uh, his uh, indoctrination into the weight room um, junior year. And then senior year, he was really all in on the weight room. That was big. But I'll say this kind of like a uh, bit of an intangible, I guess, with Wenyon was always seeking like and very open to coaching um even if it came in the form of criticism right where like you know it's it's not necessarily criticizing the person it's you know just like what what am i not doing well tell me right now what i'm not doing well because it can be evident what they are doing well um but he was always open to that so he would you know he would say to me like Coach, don't be afraid to be like a little critical here, you know, um, even in game film, uh, we would sit down sometimes and watch, you know, and, and he would always remind me, you know, because he, in a short time, he became, you know, the best player. He was here as a junior and he was probably the best player, even when he was a junior, maybe not statistically all the time, but he had, you know, a lot of talent, but then senior year became a leader and was clearly the most talented guy. And so as a coach, you know, you're, you're making sure that you're watching everybody, but he'll say, you know, coach, make sure you focus in on me too, because I want to know what I'm not doing, you know, for, for me to get better and for me to keep leading the team the right way. So, um, and Kyle is very open to coaching too. Mm -hmm. So there's that, there's that similarity there where, um, you know, he came out of the game a couple times this weekend and, you know, go down, get your drink of water, come sit here, you know, in between our, you know, assistant coaches and let's, let's talk about something for 30 seconds to kind of, you know, talk about what's going on out there. And he will never shy away from listening. He'll ask a question. And, you know, when he, when, when we're on the same page, he's a guy, Kyle's a guy, he'll look you in the eye and say, I got you, you know, and that's like, that's all you can ask as a coach. So it's, it's the work ethic, you know, the innate things that come with, you know, the talent that they have, but the work ethic and then um, being open to being coached. Yeah, no, that's great. Tell me this during COVID, Mike, did you come up with any new coaching ideas that are maybe outside the box that you wouldn't have done previously? How do you feel like sharing? I mean, if it's proprietary, you know, you don't have to yeah, share it. No, but. nothing. No, nothing that I'll probably okay. try to copyright or anything. Uh, <laughs> um, I think it was um, nothing that's, I wouldn't say that relates directly to like 
any sort of like strategy or anything like that, or, 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 you know, how I really would manage my team necessarily. But I think it, it uh, renewed my sense of just an appreciation for being able to play the game um, because having a period of time actually early in the winter of not knowing if we will ha- we would have a season. That was scary. Um, Cause I-, I hadn't missed a season in a, a basketball in a very, very long time. Um, and really, I think in the past, 22 years I was only not involved with a team one bas- one winter basketball season in 22 years and um, to have that you know to be on the doorstep of maybe not having a season it just it, it kind of revitalized you you know and, and gave you that renewed appreciation for when we finally learned that we were going to play Worcester first game of the year you know and Jamie and I finally got the okay to play I was like, man, we're, we're just lucky to be here and be able to do this, you know? And, uh, and it also kind of made it like, um, even more okay to say like, let's really have fun. Mm -hmm. Let's enjoy this. Let's not get too bogged down right now in the competitive win loss thing. Um, and really the games were categorized as like kind of scrimmages of like, kind of, you know, like we, you know, there was no records. We weren't, you know, doing anything like that. There were no standings. Um, so that, that kind of allowed us to, to, I think, look at it in a different way. And I bet you Jamie and guys like that would agree. Yeah. And then, so but for people that don't know these games, these scrimmages were important to get game film of your players against different competition. And that's what colleges were just hungry for this year. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I mean, every minute of game film. Um, and, you know, what uh, What we actually did at Worcester was we actually played an extra, um, I think we played two 18-minute halves that game, and then we played an extra quarter to try to get more guys more minutes. Um, and, you know, so that, of course, that right there, you know, kind of dials back like the formality or, you know, feels like, you know, it's not like the NEPSAC title hangs in the balance here. This is about trying to help everybody, whether it was someone that was going to potentially try out at a division three school when they showed up on campus or, you know, an an older, an older, or, uh, you know, maybe an aspiring division one guy that might've been an underclassman. Um, Yeah, you're right. Film was super important this year and we maximized what we could do. Yeah. What are your thoughts on the NCAA transfer rule? Uh, I, I don't love it. If, you know, I'm going to be honest with you. I don't love it. I'm not against the freedom of players at all. Um, I just don't love the way the rule is set up. Um, I, I'm torn. I, I'm, I'm torn on it. You know, that's why I say like, I'm not fully against it. I'm definitely not a guy that's going to tweet, you know, let's go back to the old way and have everybody sit out for a year. I don't necessarily think that that's fair either in some cases. Um, But I just don't love it. I I feel like we went from one extreme to the other. I think having, you know, the waiver thing got a little crazy, you know, maybe eight to 10 years ago where, um, if I transferred from university X to university Y and university Y was a little bit closer to home. I mean, I, I could have been going, you know, I could have lived on the East coast, gone to university X on the West coast, transferred to university Y that was maybe in Chicago and I'm still not very close to home. But if then I could find a relative that, you know, might've been ill or, or older or something like that, you know, like, I could apply for a waiver saying I moved closer to home to be towards, you know, closer to family. They were given weight, you know, NCAA was given waivers for that and it got out of hand. They gave too many and they really opened up a can of worms. Um, it got crazy. And so, um, you know, they couldn't really tighten up the waiver thing. You know, they couldn't put the toothpaste back in the tube. And so, you know, they went, they, they kept the waiver, 
system in for a while. It clearly was broken. Then they did the grad transfer thing, which seemed like it made some sense, but hurt a lot of mid-major programs. And now we have this. And I feel like we went from one extreme to the other with very little with very little consideration as to what might be a happy medium. Um, and I, listen, well, I'm, I'm going to make a, a quick point here, and I haven't really dove into this, so this isn't like my wholehearted belief, but I did hear a high major coach pitch an idea of what if, af, if a player wanted to transfer after his freshman year, we had just freshmen sit out a year, but if you waited until after your sophomore year, you did not have to sit. You did not have to do that sit and redshirt year. Just on the surface, that made some sense to me. Like I said, I didn't dive into it. So, mm-hmm. you know, I, I probably haven't considered all angles. But, you know, a little bit of my coaching soul has some old school in it. You know, probably a little bit of an old soul um, myself. Um, so that that did make some sense to me where it was like, you know, transferring after your freshman year if there was a coaching change i'd be cool with a waiver mm-hmm. you know you go for a freshman year coach leaves boy that was that was the guy i was trying to play for and now someone new comes in you want to transfer i think sorry excuse me. i think i'd be okay um with a waiver there but if you're just looking to up and leave after a freshman year i i would i would be interested to hear what it would look like for someone maybe to sit um, for a year. And I think there could be some, some really good life lessons, uh, that would come from that. Um, just the transfer portal has made things tough and I'm biased of course, because it's made things really tough for my guys. Um, I had one postgraduate this year that had, um, college aspirations, basketball college aspirations three years ago. Um, he was probably a signed, sealed, locked up, and delivered Division II guy in the fall of his postgraduate year. Maybe if he played the season out, maybe would have had some more Division I interest. Um, we had a very difficult time getting him any Division I interest at all um, because we had just heard from some Division I programs. We're just going to look in the portal. You know, we need to get older. Um, and especially at the point guard position, we want someone that's seasoned. I totally understand that from a coaching standpoint. I don't hold that against the college coaches. Um, It's a system that was created. They didn't create it. Um, But it took us until last week for us to be able to get him a spot at a Division II school. That would have never happened three years ago. Right. Right. Um, Let me ask you this couple quick hitters here uh, to end up. What was the biggest win of your career? Whether it's at, uh, you know, you know, Drexel or whether is that Wilbraham Monson? Yeah. Um, most memorable win. Um, I do have uh, one at Drexel um, winning in the carrier dome against Syracuse was a pretty cool thing. Um, and then like in the same week, we beat Villanova at Villanova. Oh, wow. Uh, so that was a pretty special week. Um, and then here at, uh, at WMA um, winning the championship um, in March of 2020. It was, uh, it was, it was a cool moment. Um, I had never won a championship as a coach, um, at any of the levels, uh, playoff appearances, but a lot of heartbreak, um, and to, you know, to break through and to be able to win that. And we had a four year player on our team, um, named John Adams, who was a, uh, captain for a year and a half, uh, going into the championship. Um, I'll, I'll never forget the look on his face and when he was able to celebrate his parents, cause we, we weren't very good his freshman year mm. and, and we, and when, then we steadily rose up the standings in his next three years and to, you know, win the championship that is his fourth year. Um, but for me as a coach to be able to watch him come in as a freshman, have some struggles, both individual and team wise to grow and then win it. Um, I'll never forget that one. I'll, I'll remember the look on his face for the next, whatever, you know, 50 years. 
that was pretty cool. Oh, it's a great memory to have with that. Awesome. How about how about this best player you ever coached against, both at Drexel and in the prep school world? Oh, best player at Drexel, uh, never coached against. Oof, good one. Um, Eric Mayner was at VCU um, when I was at Drexel. Um, he was a real good one. Uh, I think that might have been the. I think if I'm lining this all upright in my head, the year that he he really gave us the business at Drexel. I think they had a big upset in the NCAA tournament. Um, I think I remember who they upset, but I don't want to say it in case I'm wrong. Um, so that was at Drexel. Eric Maynard was a good one. Um, there was some good players at Syracuse and, and Villanova when we beat those guys, but um, Eric Maynard sticks out. And then here at Drexel. Or Wilbraham. Uh, I mean, I'm sorry, here at Wilbraham. Um, yeah. A uh, kid by the name of Wayne Selden that played at Kansas. Um, and then played in the NBA and you know, played in NBA and G league. He was like a freshman or sophomore and put up a ton of points against us when he was at Tilton. But I'll say this because of my buddy, Mike Hart, um, a former president slash commissioner of double a, um, he had Michael Carter Williams. And I, unfortunately, uh, we unfortunately got to play against Michael Carter Williams on his senior day. Ooh. And we were having a little bit of a down year that year. Um, and I think, you know, that was a what? A, that's a 36-minute game. Uh, Michael Carter-Williams probably played like 25 minutes because they were just blowing our doors off. And in 27 minutes, he probably had about 30 points. <laughs> like, he was as efficient as it comes. And we made him, you know, uh, I think he might have won Rookie of the Year in the NBA. Did he win it or, or yeah. finish out there and he won he looked like rookie of the year in the nba that day at that moment <laughs> he was he looked great he, he might have been the best okay yeah. but a, two, two good options right there yeah. Uh, yeah what are your hobbies when you're not coaching um i've uh i've i've been a runner on and off uh since i've gotten into coaching um run a couple marathons um so when my when my knees are healthy and I'm in good shape, I enjoy that. <laughs> um, like to like to just hang out with the family. Um, I'm, I'm a I love our we just a little while ago we put in our first driveway hoop, mm. um, and now uh, our middle son is eight and our youngest guy uh, just turned five, and um, they love playing on the driveway hoop. And I got to be honest, in the past month or whatever we've had that, uh, it's been a blast. And that I just enjoy those, like, backyard cookouts and, you know, just having fun with the kids in the very kind of non-scheduled family time. You know, just fun time. That's awesome. And, um, you know, uh, basketball coaching or, uh, you know, some sort of, like, coaching sport books and documentaries. Um, love, love that stuff. Love, uh, love biographies, autobiographies, and any 30 for 30s I can watch. Gotcha. What's your, what's your be best, um, 30 for 30 top of your, top of your brain? You know, I said before, I, I really enjoyed Requiem, uh, of the big East. Yeah. Um, that's, that's just a great one. I just love the coaching personalities in there. Um, that's, that's gotta be probably top two or three for me. Fab five is another cool one. Mm -hmm. um yeah so those are those are good ones all right last one what's your favorite movie of all time <sighs> my favorite movie of all time man i got a bunch besides um, titanic i know that's probably tough titanic, yeah just the <laughs> just the soundtrack to titanic <laughs> <laughs> um I, if it's okay i'll give you like a basketball one and then a yeah go for it go for yeah it. so i'm a big fan of hoosiers um I'll go on the documentary side. That's not a 30 for 30. Um, um, oh, geez. I'm going to blow the name of it now. Um, the one that followed around William Gates and Arthur Agee. Hoop Dreams. Uh, hoop Dreams. Sorry. Hoop, yeah. Hoop Dreams. Those are, those are two good basketball ones there. And then um, uh, I love the Rocky movies. The Underdog. 
I feel like at Will Bram and Munson, sometimes we've been the underdog. So I don't mind being the underdog. And uh, I spent three years in Philadelphia. I love my time in Philadelphia. You got Rocky, Philly, South Philadelphia, the Rocky, you know, the Rocky steps and all that stuff. So, yeah, I'm a big, big fan of Rocky. Oh, that's good. Some good movies there. Yeah. Well, Mike, thanks for joining us today on the uh, Prep Athletics podcast. It was a pleasure to, you know, share your story with uh, everyone out there that's, uh, that's going to tune into this. Um, where can people find you on social media and, and websites? Yeah, um, um, I'm on Twitter. Our basketball program is on Twitter, WMA um, underscore basketball um, on Twitter. And I'm also on there, uh, Coach Mannix. You can just search that on Twitter. Um, that's where I am. And um, that's, that's the majority of my social media work there. Um, enjoy our basketball Twitter connection. All right, perfect. Well, everyone, thanks for tuning in today. This is the Prep Athletics Podcast. You guys know where to subscribe and, and follow if you want to do it. It's all the major stuff. If uh, you know anyone that would find any interest in learning more about the prep school basketball world, have them tune in. And uh, if anyone needs to reach out to me, you can contact me at prepathletics.com. You'll see all that in the show notes. So, Mike, thanks so much for joining us. And I'll nice. uh, we'll see you guys next time.